All right. Well, good morning, church family. Go ahead and stand up. If you're joining us online, we're glad to have you this morning. Let's worship together.
life. Thank you all. May be seated at this time. Good morning. As we go into prayer today, we are going to pray specifically for Easter and Easter services that are coming here at Liberty and for all the people that are serving and the people that will be joining us here. So please join me in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today. Praise you for the time that we can gather here together to fellowship with you, to worship you, to praise you. Almighty God, you created us to be a a people that are in relationship with you. I pray that, dear Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit fills this building today and that we all feel that, that relationship that we have with you and we can come to you. I pray specifically for the Easter services that will be coming up, dear Heavenly Father. I pray for the people that are coming in that may not know you, that through those, they can see the celebration and what we celebrate, which is a risen Savior, the gift you gave to us that gives us that relationship. So I pray, dear Heavenly Father, specifically for those services. I pray for the people that are serving, dear Heavenly Father, on that weekend. Lift them up to you, us as members, as we invite people. Just lift everybody up. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that it's just your glory that is done and that people see that on that Easter service, dear Heavenly Father. These things we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lord, for giving us this day to be in your house, to be able to worship, worship your name, and to grow closer to you. We just ask for your presence to continue here in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated. to see you this morning. If you would, go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalm 70, Psalm 70. And as you do that, let me welcome those of you who are visiting with us this morning. Um, my name is Kyle Valer, and I serve as one of the pastors on staff here. And if you are joining us this morning, whether here in person or in the East Venue or online, we want to uh, just welcome you and say that we're glad uh, to be here with you. Glad to be opening God's Word with you this morning. I want to begin by just thanking all of you um, who helped out at opening day yesterday here in our community. So over at the ball fields on Highway 11, uh, all of the rec uh, baseball and softball teams had their opening day. And there were hundreds of families out there, and so many of you prayed, so many of you came out to help and serve with 
we put on a, a, a family area with inflatables. We had uh, giveaways for the players and coaches, and we handed out, our goal was 500 plus invites, personal invites to Liberty and our Easter services. We raced, raced past that goal. Uh, and yes, absolutely. And that is a tribute to God answering your prayers and working through you. So thank you. Thank you all to being a, uh, for being a part of that. It was a wonderful, wonderful event. So today, we are wrapping up our series called Pray, in which we've been seeking to grow as men and women of prayer. And we've used the different types of prayers that we find in the Bible to guide our understanding of prayer, how we should pray, whether it's prayers of adoration or confession or lament, thanksgiving, or the type of prayer that we're going to cover this morning, prayers of supplication, prayers that involve asking God for something. But before we get into the text and how we should be asking the Lord for things, I want to reiterate why we're doing this series. And I want you to hear me on this. The goal of this series has not been to leave you feeling guilty because you don't pray as much as you think you should, or as often, or as long as you think you should, or in the way that you think you should. If, as we heard last week, God is pained with our half-hearted worship, then certainly he's pained by our guilt-induced praying. Remember, one of our values is transform, not conform, meaning that we're after more than just behavior modification, just gritting our teeth and trying harder. If at the end of this series, all we've done is guilt you into praying more, then let me speak on behalf of Tim and Brian and myself. Let me speak for myself here, just to you plainly. If that's the case, then we have failed to teach what the Bible teaches about prayer. Your Father in heaven doesn't want to hear from you because that's what Christians ought to do, to talk to him. Your heavenly father wants to hear from you because he's your heavenly father. That's why Jesus can say, don't worry about using big, fancy words in your prayers because you don't have to impress God. You don't have to, to get him to, to, to bend his ear to you. He knows what you need already, and yet he still wants to hear from you. Why? Because you're his child. And he loves you. And he values his relationship with you. And he knows that he has created you and saved you for greater joy and satisfaction than you could ever imagine. But he also knows that you can never experience that joy and satisfaction apart from him because they're found in him. And so what Tim and Brian and I have sought to do in this series is to show you that in the Bible, the imagery of God calling you to prayer is not a disappointed finger shaking at you. That's not the imagery of God calling you to prayer. It's a heartfelt invitation to you. Come, you who are weary and heavy laden. Come, you who are hungry and thirsty. Come, you who are sorrowful or broken. Come, you who are confused or angry. Come, you who are guilty or messed up. Come, you who are thankful beyond anything and you just want to tell somebody thank you. Come to the one whose love invites your adoration, to the one whose mercy invites your confession, to the one whose sympathies invite lament, to the one whose being and faithfulness and strength invite thanksgiving, come this morning to the one whose care invites supplication. That's what we've wanted for you in this series, to be drawn in by God so that you have a real desire to spend more time with God, not because of obligation, 
but because of his invitation. We get to be a prayerful people because we are an invited people. And this morning, we're going to see that we're invited to ask God for things. And so with that in mind, if you have your place in Psalm 70 and you're able to stand, let me invite you to do so for the reading of God's word. Psalm 70, David writes this. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great, but I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Let's pray. Father, we have read your word, and we want to hear from you through it. So we just invite you to speak through your word to our hearts and change us to be more like you and to trust in you. We love you, Lord, and we invite your work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So every week, some of the pastors uh, put together a podcast for our life group leaders where we talk about the passage that we will be covering in the week ahead. And it's meant to offer a little help as they prepare for the upcoming lesson. And this last week's episode had me walking through Psalm 70 in anticipation of today's message. And I began by admitting um, that as I started to prepare for the podcast, I was struggling to remember why in the world I picked Psalm 70 for this particular sermon. Um, like it's a great psalm. It just seems a bit of a different kind of pick for a, a sermon like this, which is fine because we're going to see that it has a lot to teach us about prayer. But, but when I read it again for the, uh, in pr- preparation, it just reminded me of a couple things. Number one, don't ever put your ultimate hope in me or anyone else that's standing on this platform because we confuse ourselves sometimes. And then number two, uh, I'm grateful that God is perfectly capable and willing of working through our confusion to bring about clarity. He is. And I hope you're uh, thankful for that too in your own life. What we're going to see this morning is that Psalm 70 is actually a very straightforward prayer of supplication by David in the midst of a very difficult and urgent situation. There's not a ton of flowery language in Psalm 70. It's very clear what's at stake here. David's in urgent trouble and need, and he's calling out to God for help. And at its basic level, that's exactly what prayers of supplication are, simply asking God for something. David approaches God without any tricks or religious show. He doesn't have the time for those kinds of things. People are after his life, and all he knows is that the answer to his situation lies beyond his ability. That's the posture of proper prayer, neediness, neediness. It's needy people who pray. Proud, self-made people don't pray. Or if they do, it's not to gain help, but to impress God or those around them. But David's desperate. He says, make haste, O God. Hurry up. Don't delay. Don't take your time. I need you now. We can't be certain what David's facing at this point in his life. We we know that he had a lot of different situations in his life that would have been desperate, but we don't know which one he was going through when he wrote this psalm. All we know is that David knows his needs can't be met apart from God. And in that way, we can absolutely track with what David's saying here. Many of you in here have been in that place of being desperate for God to move in your life. 
so that you're calling out to him and asking him to hurry up, to not delay and come to your aid, to come to your help. Many of you have looked up to the heavens in prayer, completely at the end of yourself, and been begging for God to move in some way, somehow. Maybe it was deliverance from that sin that you had given into for the 4,000th time. Maybe it was the illness of the loved one or the pain of loneliness or the overwhelming grief that has brought you to that point where all you could do was look to God and say, hurry up, God, I need your help. David's there, and rather than turning away in bitterness and silence and unbelief, he opens his mouth and he calls out to God in prayer. And what he asks for is for his enemies to be put down and the Lord to be lifted up. Look at verses two through four here. He says, let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. He wants his enemies to be put down and his God lifted up. His enemies put down. In other words, he wants those who are taunting him and threatening him to have to turn back because of their failure and shame. He wants those who have spread a net for his feet to come up empty-handed. He prays that they would have to leave the scene because of their disgrace, that they who were walking around in proud uh, self-assurance and self-righteousness, thinking that everything was going to work out in their favor, that they have to leave the scene in disgrace because it hasn't worked out in their favor. They are seeking his life, and they find joy and satisfaction at the thought of David falling because of their plans. But David wants all of the shame and the humiliation that they're seeking for him to be turned back on them. Because these are not just personal enemies of God or of David. Remember, David is God's chosen king. He's the one that God has promised to bless and to bless Israel through. And it's David's family line that God has promised to uphold and to one day bring from it one who would reign forevermore. And so far from being a personal dispute that David is in, these people have firmly set themselves against God. That's why David's next words in the psalm are all about the Lord's praise, because true prayers of supplication ultimately seek God's glory. Ultimately, at their highest, highest aim is God's glory. David's concerned that God's people would be able to do two things, to have great joy in the Lord and to make much of the Lord. They'll have great joy in the Lord because unlike David's enemies, their hope will come through. Their hope will stand. Everything that they were anticipating, everything that they were hoping for will be fulfilled. The plans and purposes of their God will succeed and they won't have to turn back in shame and disgrace like those who oppose God. So he's praying that the confidence of these people in God would be vindicated, that they would be proved right and sure and good. When we've looked, is this not um, the great promises we have to look forward to as believers ourselves? That one day, all of our faith will be turned to sight and all that seems so out there to those around us, all those that, that have uh, looked at us and mocked our faith or looked at us and gone, how could you believe that? One day, all of it will be proved right. When we've looked like fools for believing in the God of Scripture, when we've been told over and over again that we will wind up on the wrong side of history, won't it be such a source of great joy and satisfaction to have our faith proved true, to have hope to have our hope vindicated in the presence of all who put down our faith. This is what David's praying for. 
that all who have opposed God would be put to shame and all who have hoped in God would be lifted up. And in that joy, we would be able to loudly proclaim, God is great. David's enemies are plotting against him and they're whispering with one another and looking to the day when they will shout in triumph over David and his God. But here David looks to that day when far from hiding in danger, God's people will loudly proclaim, there is no one greater than our God. And unlike his opponents, whom he prays will hide in disgrace, David longs for the day when God's people will openly and proudly and confidently shout, God is great. He doesn't know how God's going to bring it all about, but David's ultimately asking for God's enemies to be put down and God's glory to be lifted up. This is the aim of all worthy petition, that God's will would be done and his glory magnified. That's not to say that we shouldn't pray for the daily concerns of life or that God is somehow disappointed when, uh, when our prayers are filled with things that don't seem to be as big and overarching as God's glory or God's will. But it is to say that when we remember the one we're praying to and we allow his word to shape our prayers and our perspectives, then we increasingly place everything under the overarching goal of glorifying God and making much of him. That's what we do. We bring our requests with confidence because we believe he loves to hear from his children, yet we're confident that he knows what's best, even when his best means that his answer is no, or his answer is wait. We trust him enough to believe that his will is perfect, even when it, isn't quite, it doesn't quite match what our desires are at that moment. Because ultimately, the prayer of supplication trusts in God's provision. Look at verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Now, when David says, but I am poor and needy, the idea is probably something like, as for me, I am poor and needy. In other words, in light of his enemies and in light of the Lord, David sees himself as completely powerless and at the mercies of those around him. Now remember, for the majority of his life, David's the king. David's ruling over Israel, and so there's a good chance that he's writing this when he's got more resources at his disposal than anyone else. But he's aware of how deceiving resources and control can be. He doesn't trust in his horses and chariots. He doesn't look to his royal treasury for hope. He knows that all the political alliances and all the maneuverings that he's done over the years, that those things won't stand forever. Despite his following and despite his prominence and connections, David knows that he's really just a sheep that's helpless if God doesn't come through for him. Friends, you and I don't make our requests often because we don't think we need to. Oftentimes, we don't make our requests before God because we don't think we need to. We fall for the illusion of control. And so we live lives that involve very little prayer, be it our paychecks and our 401ks or our years of experience and saying, hey, I've been there. I've done this before. I know, I know the way forward with this. You and I are tempted to live as though we're a, le- a lot less needy than we really are. Self-reliance and independence are hallmarks of a successful life. And to be sure, there's something good and right about living in a mature way that handles your responsibilities. We're called to do that. But Scripture also reminds us that while we do that, we better be very vigilant that our hearts don't drift into thinking that we've done it all ourselves. And that we, we've not needed and continued the need, to need the Lord at every step in every moment, throughout every day. In fact, let it be a red flag for you if you can get through the day without asking God for something. Let it be a red flag for you. 
Let it be a warning for you. If you can't remember the last time you brought some decision before God asking for wisdom, some need before God asking for help, some problem before God asking for an answer, let it be a sign for you that quite possibly you've been lulled into thinking you have more control than you actually do and that things are more secure than they really are. We pray to God not only because we know who we are, but also because we know who he is. At the beginning of the psalm, David pleaded with the Lord to deliver him and to help him. And here in verse 5, he calls God my help and my deliverer. It matters for your prayer life who you believe God is. When you know the Lord is powerful and willing and loving, you pray differently than if you think he is weak, unwilling, and cold. The illusion of control isn't the only reason people don't pray. There's another reason. Wrong thoughts about God. You see, right thinking about God leads to more persistent praying to God. David knows that God's the source of his help and deliverance. He knows the scriptures, and he's seen the Lord come through time and time again in his own life. And so he prays once more, confident that God not only hears his prayers, but also confident that God will move on his behalf again. Brother or sister, who is the God you are praying to? Is he the God of the Bible? Or is he some old man in the sky caricature that you've thought, uh, that you've bought into? Is he your good father and shepherd who can and does provide for your every need? Or is he some weak, passive, distant deity that is too busy for you? Is he the one who welcomes back the struggling sinner with mercies that are new every morning? Or is he the stern, hard to please, angry God who only looks at you with disappointment? Man or woman, who is your God? David knew the true God, and he knew God's salvation, and so he prayed, and he prayed urgently and often. And the question is, is the same true about you? God invites us to make our request known to him, and over the course of Psalm 70, we've seen a believer do that with boldness and urgency, And despite my own ignorance about my choice of Psalm 70, I hope you can now see that it actually has a lot to offer. But I think that there are also three very general principles for prayer that we can draw from it as well. And the first is this. Short and to-the-point prayers are okay. Short and to-the-point prayers are perfectly fine. Psalm 70 isn't a long prayer by any means. It's just five verses, right? But it reminds us that word count doesn't matter when it comes to prayer. What God desires from us is not measured by time, but by surrender. If in prayer your heart calls out to him for five minutes, 30 minutes, or three hours, it's not the time frame that pleases the Lord. It's the fact that it's your heart calling out to him. Remember, Jesus said as much in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, we we shouldn't think that we'll be heard for our many words. Instead, we should know that our Father in heaven knows what we need, and we don't have to impress him with our verbal ability. Sometimes, all you can say in a moment of suffering and desperation is help. And the good news is, that's enough. Still, there are other times when you can't even get that far. And the heartache or the anguish is great, so great that you can't even find a single word. It's where Romans 8 comes along and it says, that's okay too. In verse 26 in Romans 8, it tells us, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Put another way, when you're so broken When you're so confused that you don't even know what to pray, God's Spirit knows and He prays for you. He intercedes on your behalf. He's able to say to your Father what you need to when you can't find the words to say it. One of my favorite stories in Scripture is in Exodus when, I think it's in Exodus, when Moses um, 
intercedes for the people who have been complaining and the Lord sends fiery serpents into the camp and, and these serpents are biting the people and they're dying and the people say, Moses, help us. And he goes to before the Lord and, and he says, Lord, I need your help. These fiery serpents have come in judgment. And he goes, make a bronze serpent and set it up on a pole. And when someone is bit, if they'll just look to the bronze serpent, I will save them. I will, I will heal them. What did they have to do? Did they have to say long, flowery p- prayers? No, they just need to look. They just got to look. Sometimes in your suffering, sometimes in your hurt, sometimes in the the disappointment of life, all you can do is look. Maybe you can't even speak. And God says, that's okay. As long as you're looking, that is an expression of faith because you're looking to Christ. Should we seek to grow in our prayers? And is it okay to be purposeful with what we say in prayer? Of course. There are some long and beautiful prayers in the Bible, but they're beautiful and effective not because they're eloquent and long-winded. Prayer that's pleasing to God is pleasing to him because it expresses a heart that's looking to him. And whether such faith speaks long prayers or short prayers or heart prayers that you can't even put into words, what matters is is that it's done in prayer faith. Second, so short and to the point prayers are okay. Second, using scripture in your prayers is helpful. Psalm 70 is actually one of the very few places in the Psalms where David repeats himself. You see, Psalm 70 is actually just David using a small portion of an earlier Psalm that he had written, Psalm 40. And he's reusing it again in his new situation. He's doing what we've been talking about throughout this entire series, allowing Scripture to give words to prayer. Now, of course, by the Holy Spirit, he's also writing Scripture as he's doing this, and we don't do that. But I do find it very helpful to know that David, like King David himself, relied on God's Word in his prayer life. By using the Bible, we learn not only the types of things to pray for, but also how to make our petitions known. Sometimes, in the urgency and depths of emotions that we experience, we struggle to come up with how to express ourselves. But as I've said at other times, in the Bible, it's almost as if God is saying, hey, here are some words you can use. Here are some words that can describe what you're going through. Not in the sense that biblical prayer only uses biblical language, but that Scripture really is an aid to our prayer life. And David shows that in Psalm 70. Life's pressing in on him. His enemies are at his door. He doesn't have time or the strength to offer anything new up to God. So he reaches back into the treasury of God's word and he finds the prayer that he needs to pray. You and I can do the same thing. If you're new to prayer or you're struggling with growing in your prayer life, do what David did. Take up God's word and let it lead you by the hand to deeper and more meaningful prayer. Just think, in the Bible, the Lord is speaking to you, but he's also training you to speak to him. So perhaps this week, try praying with your Bible open. Try try praying with your Bible open before you. And see if you don't find yourself interacting with Scripture and with God in a way that's different than your normal practice. I'd encourage you to do that. And then third, remembering is the key to right living, or right praying, excuse me. Remembering is the key to right praying and asking. At the beginning and end of this psalm, David addresses God using the Lord's covenant name. And that covenant name is Yahweh. In our English translations, you know that uh, most of you probably are aware that in the Old Testament, when God's covenant name, Yahweh, is used, we don't translate it Yahweh, we translate it Lord in all caps. 
And sometimes we forget that when we see that in our Bibles, it's not just a generic term for God. It's his personal covenant name in the Old Testament. So what David is doing by using the name is remembering who Yahweh has shown himself to be in the past and how Yahweh cared for his people throughout the ages. David's not praying to some general deity who may or may not exist. He's praying to Yahweh, the one who created all things, the one who parted the Red Sea, the one who defeated Israel's enemies, and the one who set David on the throne. This is the God with whom David has a relationship and a history. David knew Yahweh. He knew that Yahweh was his help and his deliverer. He'd seen the Lord come through time and time again, even before Psalm 70, when David had written Psalm 40. And by remembering what had happened back then, he was able to faithfully pray what was going, for what was going to happen next. And the same is true for me and you. When you address God as Father, that means something. When you pray in the name of Jesus, you're relating all that you are saying to all that Jesus is and all that he's done for you and all that he's promised to do. You're calling on the one who died for your sins on the cross and who was raised from the dead for your salvation. You're crying out to the one who saved you by by his grace and gave you redemption through faith in him. As a Christian, you never pray in a way that's isolated from all of these truths and especially the truth of the good news of Jesus. But if you would ask rightly, you must remember rightly which again is another reason to stick close to the word of God in your prayers and learning to grow in praying to him. Psalm 70 might be one of the shorter psalms, but it's packed with lessons for us when it comes to prayer. As God's children, we have the privilege of asking God for what we need as we seek the Lord and trust in his provision. We don't have to pray long, We don't have to pray these very complex and and flowery prayers to bend his ear. We have the scriptures as a trustworthy guide in our prayer life. And we can pray in light of who we know God to be and what he's done for us. Psalm 70 shows us that whether we're in the middle of one of the storms of life or just the mundane routines of life, we can trust the Lord enough to call out to him and ask things of him. We can believe that he'll answer us in the perfect way and in the perfect time. So as we bring this series to an end, let me encourage you to put these things into practice. Think back through the things that we've covered in this series. Remember how worthy and good God is, and then adore him for it. Remember how great his mercies are, and brother or sister, run to him in confession. Remember how sympathetic he is, and let yourself cry out to him in lament. Remember how kind and mighty he's been on your behalf and give him thanks. Remember how near he is and call out to him for help. This morning, we've seen that God intends for you to ask things of him. And again, it's not the mark of maturity to believe that you don't need the Lord as much as you need to. It's quite the opposite. Your God has not brought you this far along hoping that you'll finally take your life into your own hands. He's created you to need him. And he knows that you need him. The question is, do you know that you need him? In terms of salvation, have you shown that you need him by surrendering to Jesus and trusting in him for the forgiveness of your sins? But in terms of your walk, With Jesus, does your prayer life testify to the fact that you know you need him? As I said earlier, you're probably not facing the same type of situation that David was facing when he he wrote this psalm. But you don't have to be facing the exact same thing to know that this life involves a lot more than you can handle on your own. 
For some of you, life has driven you to be a man or woman of prayer, and for that, I am grateful. And I want to encourage you to keep seeing your need for Jesus and keep calling out to him. Keep doing that. Some of you are amazing men and women of prayer, and we, the rest of us, are learning from you. Keep going. Don't think that you grow into independence. Keep needing him more and more and seeing that need clearer and clearer. For others of you this morning, life has beat you down. And the burdens of your responsibilities or the struggles of your relationships or the uncertainties of your next moves, these things are weighing on you. Let me urge you to keep close to the Lord in prayer. Don't fall for the trap of thinking the way out of all of that is trying to get everything in control trying to handle it all so that everything's in its proper place. It's not going to lead anywhere good for you. Surround yourself with people who can pray with you and for you. God is your help. Jesus is your deliverer. He hears your prayers, and he will come to your aid in the perfect way, in the perfect time, with perfect love. Don't give up asking Keep praying and trust him enough to be the man or woman of prayer that God intends for you to be. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful this morning that you are a God who invites us to ask things of you. So this morning we pause in this moment and we do ask We ask that you would meet us in our needs. Every single person in this room or in the East Venue or online, you know what they need. You know the specific situations that they are in. You know the particular burdens that are weighing on their hearts. God, I pray, we pray not only for ourselves, but for those around us. We pray that you would meet them where they are. God, you would be their strength. You would be their wisdom. You would be their hope. You would be their confidence and joy. Lord, help them to trust in you enough to to stop trying to do it on their own. But Lord, to surrender to you, whether that's for salvation or just for faithfulness in the hardship of walking this road of life. God, we're grateful that you are our Father. And that you're not the, some distant God who is uninterested in our lives but you've invited us to ask for our daily bread. You've invited us to ask for your mercy, to ask you for your wisdom. And so during this time, as we sing to you, as we call out to you, show us how much we need you and show us how good and loving you are to meet us in that need. May your name, Jesus, be lifted high as we look to you and we ask you for things. In Jesus' name, amen.